So, uh, good evening. My name is Sonia Vera, and uh, I'm really glad to be here this evening. And, um, you know, this grew out of a, you know, a lunch that Rick and I had not that long ago, actually, uh, three, four months ago, something like that. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, how uh, Rick actually asked me, I think, the seminal question. He said, to me, what is really important to you as a manager? And, you know, what would you sort of figured out over all the years of business? And, you know, and that's what kind of gave rise to sort of these four issues that um, are actually very near and dear to my heart. You know, this whole issue of principles in, in leadership, the, the notion of how do you manage knowledge workers? Um, how do you, in fact, take uh, philosophy into the system to create not just productivity, but also uh, 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 foster creativity? And then, what is the most effective form of communication inside of organizations? And so we started working on this, and then we realized that, wow, this actually ties so directly into sort of four themes that echo throughout Peter Drucker's work. And uh, I'd like to say that this is a small part, but actually, we kind of realized it fits. So, and, uh, you know, the, the reality is, is um, you know, Tuck was paying much more attention to, to Peter uh, in his classes than, you know, he sometimes told me. <laughs> so, um, so I'm, you know, really delighted and honored to um, have an opportunity to welcome Meg, who has, you know, been a colleague and a friend for much more than 10 years now. And uh, I think it's fair to say that she and I have certainly I've spent more time with the working on issues than I've spent with my family for 10 of those 10 years. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the question that I get asked almost always when I say, hey, listen, you know, where have you been? What have you been doing? Oh, you must have worked with Meg Whitman. Yes. Um, what's she like? Is, is, is the number one question I get asked. And, um, you know, and the reality is, and when you get a chance to, to, to meet her, uh, she is wicked smart. She has an incredible sense of humor. She and I used to you know, have a, a bobbing wall to a conference room that we used to share. And there were times when I'd have to stop my meeting because of the peals of laughter she makes for me. Uh, I've never walked into a meeting or walked out of a meeting with Meg without you know, sort of some issue that just had us literally rolling with all the laughter. Um, she is that rare combination of sunny optimism and steely grit to actually get done. Uh, there's not many people, uh, there's certainly none that I've had the pleasure of working with that have exhibited those, that combination of leadership qualities. And you know, one of the things is when you sit with Meg and you can work with her day, she will listen, she, she just absorbs everything, and then she makes up her mind. And then I will assure you, all of all of us who actually work with her, watch out. <laughs> because Meg has just a fearsome, a massive, and she will go out and get it done. You know, once Peter sort of spent a lot of time absorbing information, and then made that decision. She is as tough as nails, but she has to be. Uh, but much more of this, you know, what I, what I really respect, admire, and value is she has this inner core of what I can only call sort of a moral call and a sense of what is right and a sense of what is wrong. And so when we spoke about this conversation and you know the, the first of which was around the character of the company, it just, you know, and made an immediate snapping connection to Meg Whitman. And um, so uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to get her book before she became character of Whitman. So uh, you know which is which is great. Um, you know, as I, uh, uh, and, and I think by way of introduction, I don't need to tell you about Meg's leadership background, uh, you know, the school she's gone through, the companies we've got, really the defining institution of, of American business. My favorite, however, is that she was responsible for the potato head at Amazon. <laughs> so let's give a really warm <laughs> demo. Uh, Rick immediately printed out the invitations 
Uh, you know, as soon as we learned uh, EMF, and I know this is not a political meeting, but uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm delighted to be here. What a nice setting, and um, Rajiv is one of my close friends, and so when he asked me to do this, I said, absolutely. So even though I announced I was running for governor of California about 10 days ago, I said, you know what, we're doing this anyway. So. so um, Nick, you know, I, 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 when we started talking about this whole issue, right, about the character company, there's so many questions that I could give you, um, and so many things we could talk about. But I think, you know, the, the question that comes to my mind is, this is just wide open, right? You know, what is character company? And so, what does it mean to you? I think it means the set of values and principles by which you run the company that really, in the end, becomes part of the DNA of the company. And the phrase, character of the company, came from our good friend Howard Schultz, right. who was on the board of eBay for many years. And at a particularly naughty time in the, um, in the early stages of eBay, um, and we were trying to wrestle with a problem, which I think we'll tell you about in a moment, and he said, Nick, what kind of company do you want to run? What, should the char what do you want the character of the company to be? And it became a phrase that encapsulated for us you know, what really became, I think eBay became known for, which was that moral center, that sense of right and wrong, that we ended up, I think, doing a good job of instilling in 15,000 people in 30 countries around the world. Right. And it's almost that sense of you know what to do. It's not written on a piece of paper, but you know what the right thing to do. And, and you know, one of the things that you took personal interest in doing was just saying that, listen, this is important to imprint very early on. What, what was sort of behind that? You know, so, almost before we online anything. Yeah. I mean, you know, Rajiv and I joined eBay. I think we had about, I joined, we had 30 employees, so maybe we had 60 by the time you came. And the company had doubled. Right. <laughs> yeah, <about> two months. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's important because companies form culture very early on, and they get imprinted very early on with a sense of right and wrong. And it starts from the top, it started from the CFO, from the president and CEO. And so I think I had this innate sense that we needed to establish very early on what the code of behavior was going to be, what the code of ethics would be. And it's easier when you have 30 people in a room. I mean, eBay was half the size of this room for the first year that we were together. And I saw everybody every day, Rajiv saw everybody every day. And so it's easier to imprint a set of beliefs and values when the company is small. And revenues were four million. Four million. Uh, I mean, it's hard to remember. Why was this, and, and, and this is a question I, I'm not actually sure I've asked you, why was this important to you, Nick? I think it was important to me because I wanted to lead a company that we could be proud of not only the financial results, but that we could be proud of how we ran the company. That we could be proud of the social impact we had, we could be proud of the means to the end. Obviously, we wanted to have a successful financial result, but we wanted, I wanted very much to be able to look back and say, you know, we did the very best job we could to do this in the most transparent way, the most um, upstanding way, so that we'd be proud of what we've done in all dimensions. And, and I remember, you know, one conversation that I thought was uh, really stood out in my mind where you said, listen, this is not just about doing the right thing internally. It is also about doing the right thing by your vendors, right. by your customers, and, and sort of this much broader sense of what doing the right thing was. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I mean, I wanted eBay to be known as a company that vendors wanted to work with. I wanted to be known as a company that users wanted to do business with. And I remember one particular story. We'd done a deal with a well-known bank in San Francisco where they had invested a large sum of money in a joint venture with our company called PayPal. And it didn't work out the way we had hoped. And in the end, we disbanded this joint venture, and we actually gave them the money back. And we didn't have to give them the money back, but it was the right thing to do. And over time, our relationship with this bank grew deeper and deeper. And I'm a big believer in relationships. The more you give, the more you get. And it was one of those things where we didn't have to do that, but because we did, we got so much back from the CEO of that company. It, it came back a hundred times yeah. to us. So sometimes it's a little counterintuitive. It's not, you know, get every last nickel, get every last dime. It is, 
It is a sense of relationship. Right. And, and it created some odd dynamics in negotiations sometimes. It did. You know? yeah. <laughs> because you'd be sitting there, you know, talking to people, and they'd say, good, great, too bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what, is there anything in your upbringing? I, I know <coughs> that your mother has been, you know, is, and, and is a uh, powerful role model yeah. for you. Is there anything in your, role, in your upbringing that sort of helped define you? You know, I was the youngest of three children. I have an older brother and older sister raised on Long Island um, by a dad who worked in New York and a, a stay-at-home mom. And they always told us that the most important thing that you have in life is your reputation and your integrity. Everything else can be taken from you, but as long as you have your reputation and you have your integrity, you have the most important thing. And, um, you know, lots of parents say that to kids, and, and somehow it stuck for the three of us. And I think they um, were role models, and we talked about it a lot as a family, and, and it was really just a part of the fabric of the upbringing. I mean, in many ways, growing a small company is not unlike raising children. I have two children now who are 23 and 20, and there is a certain similarity there um, when they're so young, because right. you know you have a huge impact on how that company will become, you know, a very big company. We had a big joke about that, did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, as Meg's children were growing, we were growing, whatever issues she was confronting with these teenagers at home, somehow translated to how she talked about the teenagers. <laughs> 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 you know, yes. it was like. <laughs> it was it was it's too funny, but um, I love when you talk about your your mother as a stay-at-home mom. I mean, she was she was pretty she was adventurous. Right? Right. Stay -at -home. There's no question. She was not the average bear. Right, home. right. Um, uh, she spent a bunch of time in China. Yeah, my mother um, was in part of the first um, women's delegation to China in 1973 after Nixon's ping pong delegation, and. Um, I was graduating from high school, and I was the youngest child, and, and she wasn't sure what she was going to do after having devoted all of her energies to us. And um, so she went to China, and she decided that this was going to be her next career, and she has been to China well over 90 times. Wow. 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 That's amazing. Beautiful little Amanda. Now, you were also a swimmer. I was a swimmer. A competitive swimmer. And I know that that had some role, and I know that being a competitive swimmer is actually pretty important to you. Yes. Yeah. So you Well, I loved sports in high school and, and grade school. And um, and the sport that I was actually the best at was swimming. I was also a pretty good basketball player, not because I was fast, but because I was tall. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I loved about swimming was there was a direct relationship to input and output. You know, the harder you worked, the, um, the, the more sets you did, the more diligent you were, it actually showed up in faster time. And um, I loved also the sort of the social interaction with the team. The great thing about swimming, a lot of time on the deck, a lot of time on the deck. And um, that was a really nice sort of community. It, it had a sense of, of an ethos of, of togetherness, and, and uh, I think was part of the sort of the value set that I grew up with. And the sense of there are no shortcuts. The sense that there are no shortcuts, right? If right. you are gonna, and I was a distance swimmer, again, because I was tall, not fast. And um, and I was a distance swimmer, and there are no shortcuts to that, right? The more mileage you put in, the better off, the better swimmer you are. And I felt that um, that, that was, you know, that was a really good lesson learned as a young girl, which is, you know, if it's too good to be true, sometimes it is. Oh, yes, yeah. So let's talk about some of the, the very early days of eBay. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that eBay did from its get go was actually quite unique in the history of startups in Silicon Valley. Yeah. So I give a tremendous amount of credit to our founder, who was a young man named Pierre Omidyar, who I met when he was 29 years old. And in a little known fact, he wrote the code for eBay in a weekend. Oh. And um, had a tremendous sense of right and wrong. For a young man, um, I met Pierre when he was 29, and he was—he felt like he was going on 40. You know, yeah. he was a prince of an individual, and um, he had an idea, along with his original co-founder, a fellow named Jeff Skoll, that wouldn't it be interesting if we could take a block of pre-IPO stock and put it into something called the eBay Foundation. And so we took a um, million dollars worth of eBay stock, valued at what it would be valued at the IPO. 
and put it into the foundation, which meant we had to take it as a charge against the PL. And you'll recall the total revenues of the company were four million dollars. So this was an enormous charge given the scale that we had. And Pierre and Jeff and I felt very strongly that if we could seed a foundation with free IPO stocks, we might be able to do a tremendous amount of good. And of course, in the end, that foundation at its height ended up being um, worth about $60 million. Right. And, and it's a blueprint for what a lot of companies Exactly. This had never before in Silicon Valley. And it became the role of virtually all the successful IPOs or um, you know, any of the other, they, they have all done this set up. Because you know, Google did the same thing. They put a million dollars in, and it's probably three hundred million today. You know, so the, the the premise of this was very powerful, and it was a great role for all models for the rest of Silicon Valley. Now, you see, come into eBay, you know, thirty people, and and uh, Pierre and Jeff tell this fabulous story about you know when next company to interview, they decided they kind of needed to look a little official, so they hired this, hired an assistant to sit out front, <laughs> and uh, there's this huge hole. In the, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the wall right behind Betty's desk. So they quickly got a, a sign carved out of uh, Caracol, uh, an eBay sign, and stuck it over the hole. <laughs> and so, so, so I'm just trying to give you a sense. I mean, this is a 2,500, 3,000 square foot entire space. Oh, I mean, I right? think the whole office was about half the size of this room. It was about half, half the size of this room. Uh, and on the third floor of you know, a very modern uh, office building in Santa Fe. Um, and Meg, of course, is coming you know, from Boston. Uh, she's coming from a corner office and you know, probably mahogany and all kinds of good stuff. And so you come over here and you aim to imprint a certain character onto this company. Yeah. And what were you solving for? Well, I think what I was solving for, and I think the only way to do this is as you live real life examples every day. Um, every day there are teaching moments. Every day there are, are opportunities to grapple with issues that is how organizations learn. And um, I think one of the early lessons in grappling issues that we had is it's hard to remember back in 1998, but the internet was much more of a wild, and wild, wild west really than it is now. And there was something called the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And what that said was that certain venues like eBay, like AOL, like Yahoo, were not responsible for the content of what was on your site unless you actually looked for what was on your site. And if you took down items that were not legal for sale, all of a sudden you became responsible. I, this was the fight dog. <laughs> well, it's a fight. Okay? I mean, we all thought it was odd, yeah. but it, it was a big court case. It, you know, I don't know if it, I don't know if it was decided by the Supreme Court, but it was a very important um, landmark case. The sense in of you sort of incur liability if you try to do the right thing. Exactly. Case. And um, so the conventional wisdom of the West Coast case at the time was um, you had to do notice and take down. So let's say there was something that was illegal on our site. If the owner of that item, whether it was a copyright or whatever, said, please take it down, then you could take it down with impunity, but you couldn't proactively take it, take it down without being liable for everything on the site. And um, so we were a very young company, and for the first six months, we said, okay, well, this is how it's done in business, and, and we will do that. And there was a seminal event <laughs> that um, the video game companies, Activision, Atari, Sony, um, we're starting to see bootleg copies of video games on eBay. And um, so I went over to um, a meeting with the CEOs of the video games. And this was in New York? No, no, it was in Silicon Valley. It was in Activision. Right. And Larry Probst was the CEO of Activision. And he said, Meg, you know, there was a game that was developed by our engineers that was called Cop Killer. And I stopped the development of that game but there were almost finished versions of the game that were in our development labs, and they were leaked out of the development labs, and those games are now on eBay. Selling like hotcakes. Yeah. And he said, you need to be proactive about taking these kinds of items down. And I said, but the Digital Millennium and Copyright Act, you know, we can't do that, we would jeopardize the whole thing. And he looked at me and he said, um, what's the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. And I came back, we had a board of directors meeting that afternoon, and um, the board, you know, I said, I think we have to change our point of view on this. 
And that afternoon, actually, we began to proactively monitor the site for illegal and infringing items. And um, I remember having to go back out to the 40 or 50 people who worked at eBay at the time and say, yesterday, we had this point of view. We were abiding by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And you are right. We are completely changing our mind. And we are now going to proactively screen the site. Because it's the right thing. Because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And, um, and those are the kinds of, that's how culture gets imprinted. When you, it's when you come across a very tough dilemma, you make a decision and you explain to people why it is that you did it. And that kind of thing, I mean, there were hundreds of examples in you know, our, our company's life. And, and that is how, it's a accumulation of many, many moments where you make the, the best decision and the right decision, and it becomes part of the company. You know, what you said just sparked a, a memory in me, which is, you know, it's about what you do. Um, and many years later, uh, we were, you know, the company had expanded significantly, and we were out looking for additional office space. And so Meg and I and a bunch of other the executive staff were kind of going around to then to go look at empty office space that we could lease. And this is uh, the year 2001, you know, so the new front bar of the, uh, of, of the first of the collapse of the internet had, had just struck the valley. So there was an amazing amount of space available. And I have to tell you, it was the most depressing week that I have spent. Because you walk into, you know, all these halls and all these rooms, all these offices that have been filled with hope and energy and, you know, uh, optimism at one point in time, and it was just vacant. And, and I'll never forget this one particular company that we walked into that had, you know, these banners hanging from the walls uh, that spoke about all kinds of what I can only call sort of HR fantasies. And, uh, you know, all these things about, you know, things that you ought to be doing and right things and, and of course, actually, this was not the case with this particular company. And I remember Meg and I looked at each other and said, it's not about what you say, it's, it's about, about what you do. <laughs> so, um, you know, there was a lot, you know, of, of things that happened in, in, in sort of teaching moments, as you sort of just said. Um, there was a couple of sort of strange ones. Uh, you remember Mergerabilia? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, our community of users was very entrepreneurial. I mean, practically anything was for sale on eBay. And we always enforced, if it was legal for sale on eBay, um, in the country in which we did business, it was legal for sale on eBay. And one of the very first categories where we began to wonder whether or not we needed to exercise some judgment was there began to be a category on eBay called murder Amelia which was elements of famous and infamous murders. And I remember the day where Jeffrey Dahmer's refrigerator sold up, so showed up on eBay. I said, you know, <laughs> we actually don't have to go there. <laughs> and um, it was one of the first times that we actually, and we tried to be very restrained about this, but it was one of the first times where we made a judgment call saying this is just not appropriate for the kind of company we want to be. And it was a very tough decision because what might offend you might not offend Rajiv. What might offend Rajiv might not offend me. And so it was really the CEO and, and a very small group of us who, who made some of these decisions that we just didn't want to be in that business. And we can have arguments about it. And we could agree to disagree. But in the end, you know, I had to make the call, or you know, Rajiv and I had to make the call as the CFO. And um, we didn't do it a lot, but we were very thoughtful about some categories that we just didn't feel. I had about. one that was questionable, or certainly, you know, we got question on was tobacco, firearms, and alcohol. Correct. So, um, as it turns out, alcohol, firearms, and tobacco are, are tobacco is perfectly legal for sale in the United States and, and on the internet. And um, this was another case where we said, especially in the early days of the internet, I mean, you have to remember this was nearly 10 years ago, um, you don't, you know, we just didn't know who those firearms were actually going to be sold to. We didn't know whether it would be underage kids who would be buying the alcohol. And frankly, there was a myriad of regulations where it was perfectly legal to sell wine from California to Wisconsin, but not California to Texas. And so we said, you know, there are so many issues here 
this is just one, again, one of those categories that we feel like we don't need to be in this business. And again, it turns out to be three cruise ships. Well, what happened was, so we banned alcohol firearms on <laughs> tobacco. I'm going to say in January of 1999. And um, you might recall that Columbine was in April of 1999. Mm. And there was a brief moment where we thought maybe the guns that the boys had used um, in Columbine had been bought on the bench. And in fact, they had not. But it, re, it, sort of, it made us feel like we had made that right decision. And, um, and so that was another case where we made a judgment call about you know, what, what kind of business we wanted to be in. And very interesting, because this is one that was not necessarily a financially good decision no. at the time, right? right? I mean, that in hindsight was, it was because it turned out that firearms was a very big category. And then we have this awkward issue to sort of figure out at what point does a firearm become a historic firearm, right? right. Uh, and I think we, we fixed this 1800. Right. You know, and I think we said 1860 or something. Right. And, and um, you know, firearms before 1860 were legal to sell because they were actually antiques. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting when you make these decisions because there's always second order things that you need to consider. But I think it was healthy for the company because we wrestled with these um, with our executive leadership team, and then we explained to our community of users and to our employees why we had made this decision. And again, we all, in the end, we agreed to disagree without being disagreeable. Right. And that was a really important part of our communication with our community That's of users. That's another next phrase. Agreed to disagree without being disagreeable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, we, you spoke earlier about Howard Schultz, who was the founder of Starbucks, and you know his point about you know the character of the company, and there was. So Howard Schultz, um, who is a prince of a guy, I don't know how many of you know him. I mean, he's done a marvelous job with Starbucks. Starbucks has a fantastic character as a company. They're, they've got some challenges now, but they really are a marvelous company. And um, he was on our board for many years. He's a very close friend of both Reggie and mine. And he came to a board meeting. Um, after he had just visited Auschwitz. And Howard is Jewish, and he was deeply affected by that visit to Auschwitz. And he came to the board meeting and he said, we have to take every bit of Nazi memorabilia off the site. Now, Nazi memorabilia in the United States is perfectly legal for sale. It is not legal for sale in Germany, France, Italy, the UK. And so Nazi memorabilia was not available, for example, on eBay Germany or eBay France. And um, we had a very, um, soul-searching discussion about this. Um, and in the end, we decided to ban Nazi memorabilia on eBay. Um, again, just a category that we didn't feel like we needed to be in. It was not appropriate. But it was interesting because there were lots of nuances. So we have a very big collector's community on eBay. There were many World War II veterans who had collected Nazi medals, Nazi helmets, that they had then sold as part of collectors on eBay. Um, and so the question was, how did we think about those? You know, what was the right thing to do there? And then you could go all the way to right was, it's going to be okay to sell Mein Kampf on eBay? And did you want to be in the business of banning books? And in the end, we actually said we are not going to be in the business of banning books, but we are going to ban all Nazi memorabilia. And again, a judgment call. We could disagree about it, but we just decided it was, it was the right thing to do. And Howard had a very interesting point because, of course, there were a number of people on our staff who felt that there's many other regimes who have done horrible things to people over the years, Pol Pot and, and others. And I said, Howard, how would you think about that? And Howard said, I can't think about it. I can only solve one problem at a time. And this is the problem I'm going to solve today. And it was, it was a sort of a wonderful way to, to think about this, which is I can solve the problem that I see right now in front of me without needing to solve every single thing. The best at the end of the good time. Right. 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 Um, you, know, the, you know, to me, you know, the, the whole discussion about Auschwitz was, uh, and I remember it so vividly, it was so very interesting to discuss me. And, um, and, and that was a fair sort of, sort of unanimity on this issue. There wasn't. In fact, one of our board members, who we didn't know was Jewish, mm -hmm. actually it said, it was, you know, I'm the black, you know, and it was a very interesting yeah. dynamic. Uh, well, his point of view was, 
if it's legal for sale in the country in which you do business, it should be legal for sale. It's our job to legislate. Is it our job to legislate? Right. And these are very tough issues. And in the end, you have to just follow your heart and, right. and decide what you, you know, what you think is the right thing to do. So to talk about judgment calls, um, one of my favorite stories is about cost and safety. So we actually had, we, we created a department, you know, which is by now the company of Um uh, And we realized we actually needed a team of people who just spent time on policy uh, as to what was appropriate, you know, what, what could be sold, what was legal. Uh, and the department called Trust and Safety that was run by Rob Chestnut, a former federal prosecutor. And, and I don't know if you were telling me about this the other day. <laughs> Well, it was just fascinating because every day, as I said, the community was very entrepreneurial, and every day there was an issue that needed to be discussed. And um, there was a CNBC documentary on eBay that was done by David Faber about four or five years ago. And uh, some of you may have seen it. But there was this one classic case where um, the CNBC crew was filming Rob Chestnut making decisions about what was going to be allowed for sale on eBay in this trust and safety meeting. And the issue of the day was should breast milk be allowed to be sold on eBay? And so they had this lively discussion, and Rob goes, okay, do, does, does anyone want to advocate for breast milk? <laughs> do, I, do I hear it for breast milk? And every one of his you know, team was like, no, okay, no breast milk. <laughs> uh, now, there was one judgment call that you and I disagreed on. Um, and this one was uh, when I was running pickup. And, and the issue was um, should we permit PayPal on adult sites as a method of payment? And I said no. I said no. And, and, and the next reasoning, which is very valid, is listen, this is about the brand, this is about the character, and it's about what the right thing to do. And my, my um, back to her was saying PayPal is a currency and you know we cannot actually have currency that can be used in some places and not in other places. And uh, we had a spirit of debate and you let me do what I wanted to do, which yeah. was permit PayPal. Yeah. Why? Well, <laughs> you know that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I did I'd let you do that. Yeah, like you know, companies are led by um, selections of individuals. I mean, I, I, yes, I was the president and CEO of, of eBay, but you are only as good as the people you surround yourself with, whether it's at a not-for-profit institution or a university, you are only as good as the people you surround yourself with. And I think if you want to get the very best people, you need to give them degrees of freedom, you need to give them latitude within a set of defined, um, you know, points of view, rules, if you will, and, and you need to let them figure it out. And, and PayPal is a separate division than eBay, which of course is a separate division from Skype. And this was this was a gray area. It was a gray area. And um, I was persuaded by your logic. And I said, you were the head of PayPal, and this was the kind of decision that I felt like the division president should actually make. Which is, you know, it's actually interesting as the panel of yes, it's not actually many decisions that we agree to disagree on. Right, right. It's not, not many. In fact, this may have been the only one. I'm sure <laughs> <The substance. it was. laughs> Um, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, your sense, Meg, as a CEO, about what are the risks for a company when you actually declare, you know, a character, a set of ethics for the company. Um, and, and what I'm thinking about is, the, you know, the slippery slope yeah. and the risk that you're given to fringe elements, yeah. right? And, and, and this, this is, at some level, something that you can't, doesn't get away from you and you can't actually control it. Yeah, well, I think it also gets incredibly complicated as the company grows. I mean, when I stepped down as president and CEO of eBay, we had 15,000 individuals operating in 30 countries across four major divisions. And, um, and by the way, cultural norms in different countries are Huge. very different. Um, you know, what, what um, you know, the Korean team felt was appropriate was quite different than what the, Korea, what the Chinese team felt that was quite different than what the American team or the Argentinian team. And, um, and so the way we decided to think about this and have a common, because people said to me, well, you know, how do I know what is the right thing to do? And this was something that worked worldwide 
and it worked at all levels of the organization, from president to administrative assistant. And what we said was the following. If you are in a room making a decision about an, an ethical or a moral issue for eBay, the eBay family, and your mother was in the room, or your son or daughter was in the room, or your husband or wife was in the room, and they were watching you make that decision, would you be proud to have them watch? Would you be proud if they knew exactly what you had done? And if the answer to that it's is yes, how well that translated. it translated across every culture. And then the other test we used was, would you be proud to have that discussion um, almost word for word be on the front page of the LA Times, or the front page of the New York Times, or the front page of the Wall Street Journal? And if you can't answer that in the affirmative, then it's probably not the right thing to do. And that also translated beautifully across cultures. And, and that, um, you know, to your point about fringe elements, I think that, you know, mitigated some of that because you had to sort of be able to think about the transparency of your decision and would you be happy for everyone to understand the decision you made and the process by which you made that and decision. And it's not a popularity contest. It's not a popularity contest. It is a, it's a thoughtful analysis based on what you know the company wanted to be and how did that translate it in your culture. And interestingly, we didn't have too many problems. I mean, every once in a while there would be, you know, an oh, issue someplace. Oh, love break. Um, but it was amazing how that ethos translated throughout the whole country, company, and, and 16,000 people actually understood this. And and so the record was not 100%, but I think for a company, you know, by the time I left, you know, they had $8 billion in revenue. And, um, and it, it worked remarkably well at the company scale. Um, you know, if you think about Meg, it's the character of the company and the brand of the company. How do those interactions interrelate in your mind? Is it the same are, thing? It's almost the same thing because the brand of the company that, that is facing to consumers has to embody the key elements in the DNA of the company. And you can't have a brand that is different from how you run the company. And there was a very interesting discussion I had with the founder of eBay. He said, there is a set of values that works in the eBay community. Things like people are basically good. Give other people the benefit of the doubt. And if we run internally differently than the community runs, there will be a dichotomy that will be immediately obvious to the customers. And so we have to, as the management team, adopt the values that are at work at the eBay community. And if they are not a direct overlap, there will be inconsistencies that will be immediately obvious. You know, remarkably um, mature, actually, I think, for these young founders, this whole notion that there are many companies um, that actually do have this dichotomy. Right. And, and how you can feel it as a consumer if they don't come across as authentic. Right, right. And, and when you can feel that authenticity, you actually know that that must pervade its, you know, the core of the company. Exactly. Um, now, I also know, Nick, that you know, sort of running a company, and certainly you know, for a large part of the time you've got out of CS offices, you do have to deliver a certain shareholder, mm -hmm. right? And um, the long term, many times the shareholder is an interesting concept, but not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as in saying, hey, look, you know, what about this quarter? Um, you know, how, you know, and I know we had some, some trade offs, and we had some decisions to make where you have to say, hey, listen, you know, what's the right thing to do? And then what is perhaps the financially attractive course of action? And, um, and I know there's a couple of instances where this, you know, these, and I like your, your, your phraseology, these teaching moments yeah. sort of really, really yeah. played out. Uh, do you remember the, the refund? Yeah. So you may remember that eBay had a very well publicized outage in June of 1999. In fact, June 10th of 1999. <laughs> and um, the site was hard down for 22 hours. So no trading could go on, no items could be listed, no sales could be completed. A company that had lost the trajectory of sales yes. was out of business. And even at that time, we had entrepreneurs who made their living selling full-time on eBay. I mean, today there's about 1.3 million people worldwide who make most, if not all, of their living selling on eBay. And at the time, I, I don't know how many there were, maybe several hundred thousand. And, um, and so the site was hard down. 
the CNN truck was parked in the parking lot waiting for the hourly update um, from management. That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so it was really a horrible thing because people had depended on, depended on us for their business and we were out of business for 22 hours. The site came back up for eight, was down for eight, up for eight, down for eight. It was a very rocky period of time. And about four days in, um, we had to make a decision about what we were going to do on behalf of our users. And the, the rules that were, were in the user agreement was that we would refund those listing fees for those sellers who items were, were actually scheduled to close during the outage. So for example, during that 22 hours, if our used item was scheduled to close, the auction was over, we would refund you the fee. But, but not on the site this time. And my auction had closed at its regular Correct. And then the site so, come back on. If the, the site right. was back on and your auction closed as scheduled, then Even you though did I not missed get a window of. Then you technically did not right. get a refund. And um, we sat as an executive team and we said, what is the right thing to do by our users? We have let our users down. And we made a decision in probably five or six minutes. I just put it a little differently. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> So uh, we have our head of IR, right. and we have the whole investor relations team that were on the white board, uh, calculating what the cost of this refund was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was like a finance lead at that point. I don't think I was a CFO. Yeah, he was the director of finance. The director of finance. And um, we calculated that this was going to be $20 million. Uh, you know, and this, I, I cannot explain to you, you know, how PayPal facility and just reiterated through stories and anecdotes what we expected. And I think it had um, a big effect on people actually. Um, and again, you, you will never know, right? You will never know what could have happened if you hadn't done that. And, uh, and so I think it was a really good thing to do. And again, we're sort of you know, imprinting on the company through the DNA of what we hoped we would be and then, as we grew up. Repeating everywhere, you know, so many of the things you said here this evening. Is, you know, guys, the problems don't improve the age, bring them up. You know, it, I'd much rather know about it than read about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Um, what's your steps next to look out at industry and business today? Is sort of principles and values of running a company, is it eroding and getting better? What's, what's your sense of it? You know, it has been discouraging, I think, as a, a, as a former CEO and a leader in business, and, and I bet you feel this way as well. And as you think about Enron and WorldCom and, and all the issues that have happened, and then you move on to, you know, the banking scandals and what has happened to the financial markets, it's easy to sort of lose hope, I think, and, and lose faith in American business and in our leaders. And then I think through all the people I know and respect and admire who are doing wonderful things with their companies, whether it's an A.G. Lapley, who I think you know very well at Procter & Gamble, or a Jeff Mouse at GE. And so the, the bad actors and the questionable judgments gets all the press, um, but the rock solid, day in, day out, people building really great companies that are servicing their customers and, and taking great care of their employees, um, I think it's easy to forget sometimes. And, and I do think America has, in the end, transparency works. And in the end, you know, things come to light. And we are a remarkably resilient culture. I think we're a remarkably resilient financial system. We're going to find out. <laughs> but um, I have great optimism. But there are times when it's very discouraging. And um, it's, it's, you know, you just feel badly about it. But in the end, I think the good way outweigh the bad. I believe people are basically good. And that doesn't mean everyone is basically good. It doesn't mean that there are, aren't bad actors. There are. It doesn't mean that judgments are always made in the best possible way. But in the end, I think the vast majority of people are trying to do the right thing. So with that, um, why don't you take some questions from the audience? So I think we have a couple of mics to read now. Thank you very much for both of you for coming tonight. Um, 
I had a question uh, for you, Ms. Woodman, uh, that has to do with the difference between management and leadership. You are one of uh, very few individuals in this world who are credited as being business leaders, not just great managers. What do you think uh, distinguishes between great man or great leadership and simply great management? Really good question. They're quite different, and um, I think you know, for me, I probably learned how to be a good manager before I learned how to be a good leader. Um, and that is around organization. That is around getting projects done on time. It is the tactics of getting things done. And by the way, as a young executive, it's a really important thing to do. <laughs> you know, you don't spend a lot of time worrying about being a leader when you first graduate. Like, get stuff done. <laughs> <laughs> Deliver the results. <laughs> um, but as you grow in your career, um, you have an opportunity to lead, and you have an opportunity to inspire. And I think what leaders, great leaders do is they paint a vision of what they would like their organization to be. And that can be a for-profit organization, a not-for-profit organization. What are we trying to be? What do we want to be when we grow up? What do we aspire to be? And it is that inspirational notion, this ability to um, get a whole host of individuals to follow you up a hill um, under extremely adverse conditions sometimes. And, um, and I think that, in many ways, has to do with communication. Um, one of the greatest communicators that I've ever met in business is actually Red Dave. And that ability to articulate a vision, enlist people in that vision, make them feel part of that vision, is the gift of leadership. And it, it, it can be a learned skill. I mean, a lot of people say leaders are born, not made. That's probably true for some. But I think you can learn leadership skills over time. And, uh, and I would encourage you to do it. It's one of the most fun things to do. And, uh, and you know when you've got it right. And uh, you know, we've both had times where we know we've just got it right. And then there's some times. My focus is on empowering the rest of the world and entrepreneurship and leadership. Now, we're very lucky in the United States that we have a lot of women like yourself who lead in an organization that can be role models. So when you go to my other uh, vision is to work with girls in Afghanistan who are working for us. And there are down at the bottom row. And the women here that I've met who want to help become leaders and even command managers and all that. So how would you talk to women today from a leadership standpoint of what women in the United States can do to help women across the country, not only in Afghanistan, or Iran, other places where they're being persecuted, yeah. to rise above their situations and become leaders? Because I'm happy about that if the women don't rise up. Yeah. So how, and they're doing the statistics, so what, what would you say to help young women in this audience think what can I do, yeah. how can I do to help create women in the world? Well, I appreciate that question. And um, I think the, the way I have thought about this, and, and it is not the perfect answer, is um, first, I like to think about what we can do right here in the United States to help women aspire to fulfill their full potential. And I think actually role models are a really important aspect of this. And um, it's very interesting. I have a friend here whose name is Patty Sellers who um, works for Fortune Magazine. And she runs something called the Most Powerful Women in Business Summit. And in the early days, um, I was a little, I had some misgivings about did I want to be on the Most Powerful Women in Business list or did I just want to be a good CEO? And what I came to understand is that role modeling, that networking, that mutual support made a huge difference to young women. And, um, and, and I saw that through Patty's conference. Um, so I think role models, is, is role models are incredibly important. With regard to cultures outside of the United States, and I don't know that this is perfectly relevant in Afghanistan, but um, there's a number of, you know, microfinance, may have made some of the biggest difference in terms of women standing in community from Africa to Latin America to you know, Kazakhstan to all over the world. 
because it is often women who are the entrepreneurs who are starting businesses in their communities. And um, my drug finance, you know, whether it was led by Muhammad Yunus or you know, other folks, this ability to actually get small loans, start your businesses, make your community and your family more secure, I think over time has made more difference in more communities. And by the way, 90% of those microfinance loans go to women. So that's a concrete thing that I think about. Um, I think it is incumbent on all of us while we are in our business careers or we have first this one career and then another career to sort of say, how can we give back to, how can we serve in public service? How can we give back to certain communities? And again, my theory on this is you cannot boil the ocean. You know, you've got to pick a country or pick a cause and make a difference one community, one person at a time. Because if you think about how to fix all problems, it's almost <coughs> overwhelming. So you have to say, here's what I believe, here's what I'm passionate about, and try to make a difference in an area that you're passionate about. And it sounds like you've been passionate about living in Afghanistan. And that's how you make a difference every day. I could take a question. Well, very much for coming and talking to us. Um, my question is regarding management of a corporation versus shareholder interest. Let's say that a corporation's management is interested in Africa, wants to go in and explore a market there, but it's risky, there's a lot of factors there, um, and the returns are not guaranteed. So the shareholders probably don't want to do it. Um, how would management? How would you address this, the tension between uh, management's goodwill versus um, what shareholders want? Yeah. You know, my experience, and I'd like for you to take a crack at this too, my experience is that um, most of the time, in the end, in the long run, management's interests and shareholders' interests, or, or the greater good, is actually almost completely aligned with long-term shareholder interests. In the case that you described, we face this at eBay all the time because there were many countries who wanted eBay to come to that country, whether it was Jordan or whether it was Israel or whether it was Nigeria or South Africa. And frankly, you know, in a country with less than four million people um, or a very big country where there's not much GDP per capita, it's not economic for eBay to go in. And so what we often did is we invested in a joint venture with local folks and we gave them the technology know-how we invested to help them get that site going. And, and the best example in many ways is Mercado Libre, which is the eBay of Latin America. And, uh, and so we invested in, in Mercado Libre. We knew that, that this wouldn't necessarily be a huge market for eBay, you know, certainly in, in, in a five or 10 year time frame, but we were excited about what those entrepreneurs were doing. So we invited them to our trust and safety meetings. We invited them to our strategy meetings. We gave them as much know-how as we could for our, the 30% investment. And in the end, they have done a fantastic job there. I like to think we have little impact on how well they did. But there's ways to do it that are you know, responsibly, fiscally responsible to your shareholders, but also can help bring an eBay or a PayPal to a less developed country that wouldn't necessarily be on your product roadmap. I mean, frankly, you know, Chile and um, you know Bolivia and, and some of the countries there would, I mean, by the time we developed an eBay site, it would be 2025. And so we were able to get there faster because of that. I mean, what no, do you I, I, I actually completely echo what you said. You know, the, the one other sort of way in which we dealt with this is if there is unanimity among management that it's the right thing to do, and it probably is the right thing to do for the company and therefore the shareholders over the long term. What you very often find is that's not actually the case, that there is a couple of individuals that are very passionate about a cause. And you know, there's nothing wrong with the cause, it's just not central to the business strategy of the company at that point in time. And you know, what we did is very often we would actually disavow those individuals. Um, so Guatemala is, is a great example where we actually had an individual who is very passionate about um, you know, helping the people from Guatemala actually trade and sell on eBay. Uh, I have a particular interest in developing nations, including India and Bangladesh, and helping them trade on eBay. And actually what we did is I'd take you know, my Friday lunch hour, and I'd meet with a bunch of people, 
work with outside nonprofits and help them accomplish what was important to me, not necessarily strategically relevant to the company at that point in time. Uh, Nick had a great line, you know, strategy is not the art of pursuing everything, it's the art of saying no. Right? So you've got to prioritize what's do what's important. It doesn't mean you abandon every great cause. You can find, I think, um, practical elements of leadership that can actually accomplish this kind of thing. I mean, this is particularly challenging for young companies because eBay, when I came to eBay, eBay was growing 70% compound monthly growth rate. Oh. Meaning, I joined in January, in February, the company was 70% bigger than it was in January. And we didn't have very many people. And this notion of focus, 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 how do we do a small number of things very well, was incredibly important in terms of our, our ability to be successful. So we often said strategy was the art of exclusion, um, you know, not the art of inclusion. And uh, so you have to be careful. But as you get bigger, you have lots more degrees of freedom. I mean, we have funded a microplace lending site that a folks at PayPal were, were passionate about. We've um, funded something called the World of Good, which is trying to connect um, entrepreneurs in developing countries to, to global marketplaces. So when you get bigger, you have lots more degrees of freedom. And in the last three or four years, we've had you know, far more ability to do sort of side projects that were, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, may not make a difference financially, but are the right thing. But interestingly, had we pursued them early on, we would not have had the luxury. Yeah, you know, exactly. In some way, but Thank you both again. Um, the, the theme that I see over and over is do the right thing. Yeah. And um, you talked about how you carried that out at eBay. Um, and if this is an appropriate question, just tell me. But um, and, you know, if you were to be allowed to be out there, <laughs> what are some of the things that you look at? Um, when you look at California, where do you see that, okay, we can do better here? This is the right thing to do here. Yeah. Um, or, or where are some of the areas that you want to make difference? Yeah. Well, I'll try not to take over this entire set of instances. I was just on set at an angle with the stock Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just, because this really is, is more of a business discussion, and I don't want to turn this into, you know, my stump speech. <laughs> but um, but as, as everyone in this room knows, California faces enormous challenges. Enormous challenges. Our unemployment rate is 9.3%, the third or fourth highest in the nation. Our government is effectively bankrupt. Our children are not being properly educated. Our K-12 education system is ranked 47th out of 50 states. Um, you know, the middle class is being taxed out of existence in California. Businesses can't afford to stay here and grow here anymore. And so what my focus has been and will be on, on um, trying to help California have a renaissance, if you will, is first and foremost, how do we, number one, how do we create more jobs in California? Because if we don't get an economy here that is healthy, that is creating jobs, where we are growing our economy, you cannot cut your way to greatness here. We've got to get the revenues of the state growing again. And jobs are leaving. Think about jobs in the bathtub. We're pouring in jobs into the bathtub, green tech, biotech, technology. But jobs are running out of the bottom of the bathtub faster than we can pour them in. And that is simply not a sustainable proposition. The second thing that I would be focused on is how do we get government spending under control? We spend $149 billion in the state of California on a per capita basis, which is the third highest in the nation. And it is not as efficiently spent as you might imagine. And if you just take the $100 billion, I mean, there's a roadmap to deploy technology to pull government into the 21st century where you get better customer service at lower cost. And then my third passion, because I have this, this sort of theory of three buckets, is education. We have got to kick our K-12 education system because we cannot be the innovation capital of the world when 50% of the students in LA Unified don't graduate from high school. So. And then the fellow in the, in the ah. black and purple lamp has been incredibly patient. <laughs> All right, well, thank you both. I just want to ask the two of you, what would you like to be remembered for? Are you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the same thing to you. Um, gosh, you know, this will, this will sound 
trite, but it's really true. Um, of all the success that, that I have had in business, actually I want to be remembered for being a good wife and a good mom. It is the most important thing. It is honestly the most important thing. The rest of this is all gravy. Yeah. What would you say? Oh, it's, I don't know that. <laughs> 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 well, you know, to me it is, you know, if your life is cumulative of the impact you have on the And, uh, you know, if I can sort of have a sense of feeling that I have done right by people and that I am well remembered to me, you know, that is what I would want to achieve. And and also be the closest, the meaning closest to it. And I see it as, you know, it really is the best way to do Thank you. Mm-hmm. On behalf of 
And, um, and so I think that gave the finance team worldwide the courage. If there was a problem that was uncovered, um, either you know by error or by you know someone who was a bad actor, it surfaced really fast. And um, you know problems don't get that old age. They're not like wine. <laughs> they, um, the sooner you know, the better off you are. And um, you know we figured we would survive. I mean I think I didn't really know that. I said okay, this is not going to be good, but it is what it is, and we have to we have to face up to it. We have to do the right thing. So that's a good kind of. Um, yeah. that, that 